Welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to today's webinar and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Leah Wiggum and I'm an associate professor in the Health Promotion and Behavioral Sciences Department at the UT Health Houston School of Public Health and I'm also the director for the UT Health Center for Community Health Impact in El Paso, Texas. Today's webinar is hosted by the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at the UT Health School of Public Health in Austin. The center's vision is healthy children in a healthy world. This webinar is also part of the Digital Physical Activity and Diet Collaborative, or DPAD, and our goal is to bring together researchers who are interested in addressing obesity, diet, and physical activity through technology-based research. I'm one of the co-principal investigators of the um, initial grant that funded the launch of DPAD, and I'm happy to be here today um, to introduce you to our speaker. But before we get started, I just wanted to make some brief housekeeping announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived along with the presentation slides on our website at msdcenter.org. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into your enter enter the questions into the chat box and we will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today from the United States Military Academy at West Point, Dr. Diana Thomas. I've known Diana for many years. I consider her not only a wonderful colleague, but a great friend. Uh, she received her PhD from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and she then completed a National Research Council funded postdoctoral fellowship at the United States Military Academy and the Army Research Lab. In 2000, she joined the faculty of Montclair State University, where she was a professor of mathematics and the director of the Montclair State University Center for Quantitative Obesity Research. Dr. Thomas is currently a professor of mathematical sciences at the United States Military Academy at West Point. I'm now gonna hand it over to Dr. Thomas to share her presentation, Mathematical Modeling in Precision Nutrition. Hi everyone. So I do have this as an interactive uh, slide, a set of slides. So um, we know from the teaching literature that the attention span remote is about five to 10 minutes. And so I do break it up with some questions for you. And don't think of it as a test. Think of it as she's trying to wake us up, see, you know, see if we're uh, getting what I'm trying to convey. Um, they're pretty much big, big questions. Um, and if I get feedback that I'm not conveying what I want to convey, that's a good thing. So um, this is actually right uh, one of the views when I was running um, in the morning. And you can see we're on the bank of the Hudson. It's called West Point because it's the furthest west, most western point uh, is on, um, on West Point into the Hudson River. And it's possible to turn the corner from that west, uh, furthest west point and not be able to see people shooting down at you from the top, which is why George Washington set up West Point as a prime location to target the British during the Revolutionary War. So I first wanna thank my team um, and, and Leah, both. Leah, actually, she's a very, very good friend and, and mentor. Um, and my team at West Point is fantastic and um, my NIH funding to work on our project with the Nutrition for Precision Health Consortium is what one of the reasons I learned a lot of the material that I'm going to share with you today. So thank you to those guys and Leah and everyone listening, because you're here listening to a math talk, I should be grateful. So precision nutrition, it's talked about quite a bit. And what's the buzz? What is it? What the heck is it? Um, really the I think the big buzz started with this particular paper in Sal, written by ZV and a whole list of uh, a whole list of other authors. Aaron Siegel is the um, anchor behind these uh, these precision nutrition studies. But this one appeared in 2015 in Sal, and um, you see in their in brief graphical abstract what the study was kind of about. Um, it's a beautiful graphic. Um, they measured a whole host of data in 800 people. And then they built a machine learning model to predict glycemic responses. And that's a very big oversimplification. If you really dig into the paper, there's a lot going on in this paper. So what we're going to do is we're going to unpack some of this paper, not sharing with you new results or new findings. Um, we can talk about that if you're interested, 
but um, this is the pl place where it all started. So um, the whole point of this, by the way, is that you don't want to even predict something for a population. Each individual is different. And all these myriad of data that's here can maybe give us ideas of why Leah and I are different. Um, so how we will respond differently to different foods. Why is that? Um, and if people know, if researchers know the reasons between the differences between Leah and I, and I they can give Leah her personalized diet recommendation and myself my personalized diet recommendation. So that's what we're after. And a big piece, of, a centerpiece of this is mathematical modeling. So this is what I call, this is kind of the modeling pipeline that um, ZB and um, others have structured. And ZB is not the, ZB might have been a, the first, but the PREDICT study that was uh, run by Sarah Berry is another example where it was a similar framework. It starts with data being collected. And this is not trivial data to collect. You've got your standard clinical measurements like blood pressure and all those things that you're going to measure, battery of surveys. Maybe you want accelerometry. That's not something that um, ZB's team collected, but uh, they didn't collect omics, but maybe you want to collect omics. You can think of all kinds of data sources that you think may be important for predicting an individual's response to diets. There's some missing steps usually when people talk about precision nutrition is that this pre-processing data distillation set, th these are huge data sets. And so just working with one of these alone is hard and then you're throwing them all into the same bucket. That's pretty tough. So there's some work to be done right here. And this light green piece is actually the most intense part. And then you have the machine learning model, which everybody's really fascinated by. But once you have the um, I think it's teal looking, the teal looking step done, then it's pretty simple at that point to pull a package from Python and run it through a machine learning prediction. And then you have this primary endpoint. You have to have something you're predicting, otherwise there's no reason for our model. So we're gonna get into that first actually, but this line, this arrow that goes on the back end here, you have to explain these predictions. If you're after what factors here make Leah and I different, well, you have to take this beautiful prediction that you have and unbox it in some way and understand why Leah and I have different predictions. And so there's this final step after you've done, done with the model, it predicts, every, predicts everything really well. You need to explain why the predictions are the way they are. So let's start here. Um, this is the first mystery to me. What are we predicting? We need to know what we're predicting. And what ZV uh, and the team, the ZV team did is they they looked at glycemic responses, um, glucose response curves. It's actually an entire curve, and um, it doesn't have to be relegated to just that. But let's just start with glucose. Why would that be a primary endpoint of what we're predicting? Well, the first reason is these postprandial. So you eat something and you have a glucose response. That's the primary endpoint. And they even have it in the paper, the ZB team, as uh, abbreviated as PPGR, postprandial glucose response. Um, the reason glucose response was chosen is because you expect that if Leah and I had a Snickers bar, that there will be a response right after we have a Snickers bar. So you expect there to be a glucose response to eating something. And then how we respond, let's say, uh, my glucose levels go through the roof after eating a Snickers bar, but you know, Leah's was okay. Um, having that huge response after is a risk factor for a whole host of diseases. And their project was a discovery science project, meaning that there's not a hypothesis. You're not statistically testing. You're actually looking and searching for these factors that may explain the differences between these responses that become um, from these other array of data that you're putting in to these, this gadoculator. I actually started here in Nutrition for Precision Health. I wanted to know everything I could about this primary endpoint. And I asked Chris Lynch about this, like why did they choose this? And he said it actually comes from Walter Bradford Cannon, um, the idea of homeostasis. Homeostasis is the study of conditions maintained by human bodies. And one example that everyone can understand is body temperature. Body temperature is supposed to be around 98.6 degrees. 
And if our body temperature is higher than that, we would say, well, that person's not well. If it's really high, 102 degrees, for example, we'd say that that's worse than an, uh, maybe a 101 degree fever. Um, we even named it, named it fever. So the same concept there is true that our body is trying to always hold glucose concentrations at steady state levels, at homeostasis levels. And when you eat, they go off. But the worse they go off, the more they deviate, the more problematic it is. And so that's why one of the reasons glucose deviation from fasting levels was selected as the primary endpoint. Um, you don't have to give, so these came from glucose tolerance tests. Um, if you've had one, if you've been pregnant before, you've had one of these, they give you this awful drink. It's like a really sweet drink. And then they measure your blood after you take this drink. But you don't have to give just a glucose drink. You could give something like Boost. So the idea for giving something different than just a glucose drink um, started from the oral glucose tolerance test, which is the yucky sugary drink that you drink. Not that Boost is any better. Um, and then the higher that your glucose concentrations are after you eat, and it, it's measured multiple time points after you eat, so not you can form a curve. The higher that, that curve displacement is, is associated with higher risk for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And we don't have to stop at, you know, if you're going to get Boost, Boost is not just a sugar drink. It has all kinds of stuff. It's actually meant to be a food supplement. Um, and people who are starving or has issues with uh, gaining weight are given Boost. Um, so you could measure other things such as triglycerides, and they have been measured and demonstrated predictive of metabolic risk as well. In the same way you do with the glucose, you take a sampling of time points and then you create a curve by running it through those values at those time points and um, you look at the deviation of that curve from fasting levels. The mixed meal tolerance test, like the boost, is an extension of this whole concept that started with, with the glucose tolerance test. Um, it could either be liquid, like Boost, and you bottoms up, drink it, or you could have a muffin. Um, in the PREDICT study, which was run by Sarah Berry, they used muffins. They seemed pretty good. Or you could give people foods. Like in the ZV study, they gave people bread, rice, or other specific standardized meals, and then they ran this curve after they had this specific food. I'm vying for the Snickers bar. That sounds like a, a lot better, and it's around lunchtime, so... Um, we need good food. Um, so um, I actually focused my work initially on what this means to deviate for more from normal. Um, calculating glucose um, responses is fairly easy today because of continuous glucose monitoring. This is a picture of the device that was used in the ZV study. And what you do is you give the person a, a standardized meal. In the case of ZV, they might have given a slice of bread. And then you look at that glucose expected, you expect something to happen. So you deviate away from fasting levels. And that blue part here, that blue area is considered the amount of deviation. Um, I consider it the area between two curves. If you remember Calc 2, I think that's where you learn it. You take the integrate integral of the curve, of the top curve, and you throw out the integral of the bottom curve, which is a horizontal line, but you're throwing that out. That's called incremental area under the curve. And that's what they're using in the ZV study as the primary endpoint. So then now they have a number. Leah eats a Snickers bar. They calculate, they run this curve through um, right after she had the Snickers bar. And um, then they calculate this blue shaded area. And the expectation is, which they found is, I eat a Snickers bar my deviation is going to be probably different than hers. I'm a different person. And you do see a lot of heterogeneity um, in these curves for different people, which was also shown in the, in the ZV study. It's fascinating. All right, question for you. Um, I'm going to have the moderators drop in a poll and um, ask you some questions about that primary endpoint. Oh, look at that. We already have one answer. See, I told you it's an easy softball question. We only had one person respond. 
from the link, you should be able to answer these questions. There's four of them I ask you. I've, I've used this uh, this cup hole everywhere and I've used this for teaching and sometimes I think I've given a bang up lecture. I've done such a good job. I'm congratulating myself. And then I ask a simple question. I understood what you were talking about. I somewhat understood what you're talking about. I had no clue about what you're talking about. And when half the class puts an answer, I have no clue what you were talking about. It showed me that there was dissonance between what I thought was happening and what the students thought was happening. All right, we got a half and half here. So higher curve uh, displacement was actually associated with type two diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So that's why we use this as a marker. So the answer to here is true. All right, nobody here has answered yet, but ah, I like it. Precision nutrition is cool. Hopefully, Dr. Thomas, please shut up, doesn't show up on this word cloud. May just take everyone a moment to get the survey open this first time around. So there we go. So what's interesting is um, I, I received this grant award, I remember the day, um, January 20th, 2022, um, that I received the award. My life changed and uh, I've never had so much information come at me. I've not, not learned that quickly, um, but one of the, some of the questions, like I, I think there were groups of us that got this award and some of them were experts at running diabetes studies so they knew about mixed meal tolerance tests i had no idea what it was and at the kickoff meeting i remember asking my co-chair on the steering committee what is this and she goes it's the mixed meal tolerance test die. i'm like i have no idea what that is and so um you're learning it from my lens if you don't know haven't seen this before um because this is my you know, I needed to I needed to read and understand where everything was coming from. Why are you doing this? Why are you calculating these things? So I asked a lot of questions. Broccoli, I'm, I'm like to see what the, maybe you're suggesting that as a good option for a mixed meal test. I love, uh, by the way, I'm a, a natural language processing junkie. So I like to use things like this to see what people were thinking about. All right, let's move on. Now you know, you gotta pay attention. So let's go to the data. Um, I won't have much to say about this. Like I, you know, you could collect anything you want for data and throw it into one of these models, but you wanna learn something. You know, we already know, you, certain things about, you know, we know, for example, high blood pressure might be predictive of car cardiovascular disease. And maybe if you have high blood pressure, your response curve might be different. Um, we want to learn something new in these studies that we didn't know before. And so there's novel sources of data that are out there now. Um, they're all built up. Uh, it's just really amazing to me how um, fast we've learned as a research community about the gut microbiome, um, about metabolomics data, accelerometry, you know, you, you just really these devices like the Garmin, they give you the raw data is just three columns of data with acceleration on the th in three different directions. How we distill that data, how we turn it into sleep metrics and physical activity metrics is pretty, pretty novel and it's um it's uh not as developed as you think so it, these things are just moving quickly survey data as leah knows from my discussion with her as a someone in the mathy fields we don't like survey data survey data is um hard to analyze but 
Um, I've been actually looking at the way people analyze the microbiome and thinking that can be used for survey data. And Rob Knight, one of, uh, one of the PIs for the Microbiome Center said he recently did that. So um, some of the techniques they use in these other fields can be pushed to a different field. And of course your traditional uh, clinical measures, you still want them there. So um, this gives you a picture of some of the things that I've seen in papers. A ZB study had microbiome, so did the PREDICT study. Um, some of the newer studies have omics data. Um, I think uh, survey data is always there, um, the traditional survey data. Um, I'm always an advocate of putting free text response on there. You know, if chat GPT is out there and Amazon's already looking at our free text, I think we're way behind if we're still focused on Likert type questions and that alone. So we got all this data and then comes the hardest part. One of my uh, colleagues says, once all this is done, I'm happy. I'm like, of course, everybody's happy. Microbiome data is nasty. It comes out in sequences. And well, it starts out with poop. So how more nasty could you get? So you start out with poop, get it into sequence form, and then somehow you have to make sense of that and identify it to bugs in your stomach. And so that is hard. This is incredibly hard. We're very lucky to have Rob Knight and Jack Gilbert as the PIs for the microbiome center working with us. Then you have to also visualize this and see it in some way. This is not a T test we're doing with this data. We have to kind of identify patterns in this data. Um, we do something called feature selection. I'm gonna get into that in a second, but all of this massive data, like the accelerometry data coming with three different columns, that turning that into something that's usable is hard. Um, so we wanna make that data what we call AI ready, something that you can put into a model, something that you can see that I can take to Leah, who's not a, a mathematician, I can take that to her and say, I can see these things, can you see these things too? So um, there's steps involved, there's data pre-processing, you know, there's gonna be all kinds of issues. For example, in those curves that you get after you eat something, for some reason, there's missing values at certain time points. And so you somehow have to fill in those missing values. And it's not an imputation or some existing thing that's out there because it's not a population-wide data where you're dealing with missing data. You're actually trying to recreate the curve. And Leah's curve is gonna be her own curve. I can't, I have to handle her missing data point by using her curve. So our team has actually developed a, we call it the imputer, but that's the wrong word for it. Um, we've named all our programs in, in this consortium so that it fills in and treats that missing data for missing data on a curve. You have to understand your data. Um, I heard that there was someone at, at West Point that just goes straight to run it in a model. That's, that's a bad idea. You wanna really understand your data. Know that, first of all, things should make sense. Um, that do make sense, like for example, a high BMI, which we already know is a risk factor, should be associated in some way to high response curves because we know that's a risk factor for the same thing. And so if these things don't come out, then there might be something wrong with your data. Again, huge amounts of data that are coming at you. You don't do that step and understand it well. Before you go to a model, um, you could end up putting errors into your model. Um, Feature selection is something that we that's really important um, that we do. We actually identify a list of variables or combinations of variables um, that need to that distill the data to the most important parts. If you don't do it and you're sticking everything into it, somebody asked me this once, why can't you just throw everything into it? That's actually better. No, it's not, because every single measurement is measured with some sort of error. So if you have a superfluous measurement, and it has error and you're throwing it into your model, well, guess what? You have throwing unnecessary error into your model as well. So it's not a good idea to throw everything in there. And then the thing about this type of modeling is you've got to go back and check all your work and say, does this actually make sense? Um, because the models themselves are what we call black boxes. So we don't know ahead of time that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So there's got to be a lot of iterative sniff checks so involved in making this data AI ready. Um, I found this great graphic online, data driven to madness. 
Bigger is not always better, including those model inputs that are superfluous and do not add new information can lead to errors in the predictive model. Um, and we need to collapse, transform these data to create data sets that can be plugged into models in the first place. And they're ready also for not just this particular model, but you should be able to tap into it for other things. It shouldn't be a one-time thing. It's really, really hard work. Um, Leah knows a lot about this paper because it's published at the journal where she's chief editor. Um, I'm anti push and play. Um, push and play, I would call it like a SPSS. I push a button, it runs a neural network um, because it's really, really complicated. Um, it's not like a statistical model where you can look at the coefficient and say, hey, you know, that doesn't really make sense. You can't really see in right away. And if you have a really highly predictive model, you don't know if it's predicting in an ethical way or not. Um, there's perfectly uh, great examples of where things have gone wrong. Um, so I recommend this paper if you wanna see, we cite some examples where this went wrong. And so um, I think the idea of pushing and playing is an incorrect thing to do and um, actually should be banned <laughs> because um, it makes for careless modeling. All right, I'm ready to quiz you. I said it's not a quiz, it's not a quiz, it's to wake you up. So second poll dropped in on big data and AI ready data. So I'll mention that um, you know, statistics is, I think statistics is hard and um, it's hard enough running a power calculation these things are hard we take classes on them and eventually we get to a place where we can maybe push something on spss and they also have internal checks like if spss has built into that if you know you have not satisfied model assumptions like they'll have that if there's correlations to your, your data they'll output that for machine learning some of these things are so new that it's um you have to work even harder. Um, and that's why I'm against the push and play. <laughs> so in its raw form, that apostrophe shouldn't have been there. Um, it should not actually be pu pu put into a machine learning model. It's not that simple. You have this huge step for pre-processing. Big data, for example, microbiome data in its raw form is just a bunch of sequences. It's meaningless. Um, raw accelerometry data, it's they collect at minimum 30 hertz. That means 30 measurements per second for one person. So if they're wearing this accelerometer for seven days, that's a lot of data in its raw form, and you're not going to see anything from it. So there's a lot of work that has to be done before you plug it into a machine learning model. So that's what we call making that data AI ready. Wow, good. Um, I actually come across the number two quite a bit, so I put it on here. There's a lot of lot more labor involved uh, running machine learning models, and um, we were talking about the justification to NIH when we do this. Like, it takes time, and you want people to take time because if you don't take the time, you could make predictions that have biases in them um, that could re result in um, faulty conclusions and hurt people. Um, it has the capacity to hurt people. So you wanna give your machine learning person the right amount of time to get the job done right. Right, I'm, I'm glad that some of you thought it was exciting. So I, mean, I think somebody put the push and play thing. <laughs> It's there. I get asked about this already. I was asked by one of my collaborators who's an MD, is there somewhere where I can just load this in and push a button? And I said, even if there was, you're asking the wrong person. All right, let's go to the actual predictive algorithms. I'm actually going to show you how some of this works. So I hope I have your attention. Um, typically, when I'm showing how something works, uh, that's the time people drop off and sleep. Please don't, um, I do think it's cool. Um, the actual machine learning models, there's a fascination, I think from everybody on machine learning AI models, what are they? 
So this is what ZV did. They took all the different myriad of things. They did feature selection. They talk a little bit about the feature selection, identifying what those uh, what those important factors are, and then they trained a something called a boosted uh, gradient uh, boosted regression model. And I'm going to explain how that works in a second and why they used it. And um, and then they predicted that meal response. 800 people. I know that that sounds like a big data set, but in the machine learning world, it's actually a pretty small data set. And so um, one of the things we do is we ch we do the sniff check. They this paper was written by someone, the math person who did it did a wonderful job. They did data exploration. They explained all the data exploration, but then they did all the sniff checks. Um, one of the sniff checks they did was leave out one cross validation, and it Basically, what you're doing is you take one point out of your entire data set, one observation, you take it out, and then you create a model with the 799. And then you take another data point out, and you just do this over and over and over again. And um, so I, I'm not sure how many times they simulated. Um, well, they ran this with the 800, of course. And so if your validation numbers are different, wildly different from the actual numbers that you get from training, then it says that you know the type of modeling you're doing is probably not a good thing. So it's a good sniff check, um, and you should do it with a small sample set. They also tested this in 100 independent samples that they held out. And so um, you see the R values are all close, pretty close together. One of the other things they did too is they said, OK, what's the status quo in the field? Um, they looked at some models that were being used in the field and they compared their results to the other results, which sometimes, you know, uh, we get a lot of junior faculty who come out just right after their master's and they're ready to like take the neural network to the whole thing. And you ask them, hey, let's go back to re uh, logistic regression and see what that does. If it's doing just as well as logistic regression, my money is going to be on logistic regression because at least it's explainable. And so they showed that we've done a vast improvement over these existing models. And so therefore, we're likely to find new factors that led to these awesome predictions. All right, um, now I'm gonna get into the meat of stuff. So they are using something called gradient boosted regression. And um, gradient boosted regression relies on something called decision, decision trees. The predict team relied on random forest. Random forest also is supported by decision trees. So why are they using decision trees as their underlying framework? Well, it's easy to understand. And um, they you can also put all kinds of data into a decision tree. It doesn't, you can put continuous data into it, like BMI can go in there. And you can also put liquor types data into it. Liquor type data is the bane because you can't, a lot of machine learning models can't handle liquor type data but decision trees you can throw it in there too so that's one big plus of decision trees the minus of decision trees by themselves is they're weak predictors um, they don't predict as well as like a neural network usually um, and they're they're super interpretable by themselves like this is a decision tree that you see here that came from a paper i wrote on uh, cadence with uh, katrine tudor Locke and and team and so you can see you can follow the path if they spent 0.18 seconds in a, a band of 120 steps per minute um, and you follow that decision tree down you see that um, they're not likely to have metabolic syndrome if they are in some spending some amount of time in slow slower cadences they are at risk for metabolic syndrome so it's easily interpretable, unlike a neural network where you're not going to really see, see this kind of categories um, explained. How do decision trees work? I'm just making up a made up example so you can see how that works. Um, suppose you're trying to predict postprandial glucose response, the IAUC, from BMI and um, HbA1c percents. So you've got a scatter plot of BMI and HbA1c. And you look at how well it predicts PPGRs. And you find out like there's a way to split the data so that 
maybe I made this up. So um, here at 4%, the PPDR was 200, much lower. So this is your good region. And in region two, um, it's a bad PPGR. The average PPGR was 400. And so um, this is the good part and this is the bad part. That tells you where to split that tree in that tree that I showed you. The hard part in decision trees is finding that split. And I, if you're interested, I made a series of videos just how to make that split, um, what they're doing under the hood there so you can see it. So once you decide 4% is the split, that's how you make your tree. And you put the average values of the PPGR and the both of the tree, tree pieces, just like I did with time spent in cadence bands. Decision trees suck as a machine learning model, so you don't want to use decision trees. But since they can handle all these different kinds of data, and you can maybe get under the hood a little easier, um, what you can do is make a new model that relies on decision trees and um, then predicts these individual results. So the way gradient boosted regression works is it takes a bunch of crappy decision trees, they call them weak predictors, and they look at the error. So it's an iterative model. So you're doing the decision tree process over and over and over again, and you're building up stronger and stronger predictions with each iterate by looking at the errors. You're actually decision treeing the errors, not the, the residuals, basically, to build your new model so that you're model at the end of the iterates is like a superpower model that has discarded and if you get a penalty for having weak models so all the weak bad models are thrown out and only the top models are staying in and you get this superpower model at the end gradient boosted regression is great uh, it's a great it does really well um, and there's packages in python that are out there that you can pull and i, I believe that's what the zv team had done um well, uh, I know that the PREDICT study, they use random forest. Random forest also relies on decision trees. So you can throw survey data, all that's junk into one model, and it will um, build, it is again, a bunch of decision tree models iteratively built up um, with a random component to it to build a superpower model at the end. Um, I found this curious. I didn't cite this because I'm going to make it hard for you to find it. But I, I saw a paper on precision nutrition published recently, and I was, I, I kind of had a chuckle because they said it's been proven to have the best prediction accuracy. That is not true. Um, there is no best model. In fact, um, the reason random forests are used for precision nutrition is because you have this multimodal data, and it's one type of machine learning algorithm that can handle those multiple different kinds of data. That's the reason you want to use random forests. Um, some machine learning models are designed for just ordinal data. Um, some are designed to handle only continuous data. Like if you go to a math book on neural networks, it'll tell you, don't put ordinal data into, into me. I don't, I'm not going to like it. You can do whatever you want. It just doesn't mean it's right. Best practices in our book is you need to try several models, including the baseline one, to see how much you've improved or if you've improved at all. So I would suggest always trying multiple linear regression and see how well that does um, to start with. <laughs> All right, let's go for it. What do you guys think? This is the next poll. This is um then give me that other piece. <laughs> Thank you for that absolutely false. Um, I, I've heard this in nutrition several times, more than once, and I, I thought it was the hottest thing in the world. Um, there's not a not such a thing as a best model. It really depends on what you want to do with that model. It, you know, sometimes you want to predict as accurately as you can. Sometimes you want maybe a neural network with just micro microbiome data, which you really shouldn't do either because it's count data. But maybe there's a better model for accuracy with using less of the information. But you want to know what factors are predicting this nice 
prediction. So you wouldn't want to use discard some of your other data and use maybe a neural network, even though it might predict better. So um, prediction alone is not the reason for selecting a model. Sometimes you want to program this model and disseminate it to people. So maybe you want to balance prediction with complexity. So there's a lot of reasons for choosing a model. And I've never understood when someone says there should be a best. Someone asked me in the field that you can't deny there's a best model. I said, I absolutely deny it 100%. All right, so this is absolutely false. Um, there is no such thing as you might have an accurate model, most accurate model in a whole bunch of models that you choose, but there's no such thing as we know ahead of time it's going to be random for us. Last thing, I'm not going to show you how to do explainability because I'm nearing the end of my time here. So, um, but these are black boxes. Once you've done these iterations and gone up to this gradient boosting regression model at the end, you have no idea, there's no coefficient that you're gonna look at and say, oh, with one in increase of one in here, you're gonna see, you're not gonna see anything like that. You have to do some more analysis to explain those predictions um, and why they turned out the way they did. And there's several ways you can do this. Um, the ZV team used something called, um, they use these plots um, that you build up. I forgot what they were called on blanking out at the moment what they're called. Um, but there's other ways to like unbox what you've just done and try to figure out what it is in your model that led to that prediction. The important part of this is that you're also doing another sniff check in this explainability. Does it make sense? Um, which you should, because anytime you push a button to run something, you should definitely go do a sniff check at the end. Um, DARPA was the first place that understood that you need to have explainable models because when you're using them in war and someone's pushing a button and you just bomb a civilian installation, then you wanna, you know, you wanna know what happened. Um, you can't just push a black box in war and hope things go right. Um, so there's two products that you get from the ZV type model or position nutrition model. It's the unknown factors that impact that response to diets. So you wanna know what those are and that's the explainable part of it. And then there's the algorithm itself. When you hear about the ZV paper described, you hear a lot about the model. They built a model. Like, that's not where the, the, the underlying thing is that you really wanna know something new in the microbiome that led to those predictions that we can tell people, hey, we now found this new bug that was never associated before with nutrition. And we found it actually does predict um, nutrition, your response to this diet. That's important. All right, that's my last question for you until we uh, get Q&A. Leah, I didn't know what next steps were. I can still see the slides going. Okay, is that the end of your presentation? Yes. You said 40 minutes. I probably went over a couple minutes. Perfect, no, that's just fine. I just wanted to make sure if we need to give any more time for people to fill in responses here too. Yeah, uh, if, I don't think this is still being shared, but I see expertise, diversity, complexity, collaboration, it's interesting because oh, cool. that's not showing on the screen. Just a few of those words are showing on the screen, but that's okay. Intensive, ML process. Some I'm seeing some nice things coming. Oh, neat. 
Okay, well, on the screen, I'm just seeing the first three words you listed off, so. Yeah, it's a, I got something that says that it's not sharing my screen anymore. Okay. I'm not sure why. That's okay. Um, yeah, I can send just, this to you. Just a reminder, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, for your presentation. Um, all attendees can put questions in the chat box. And while we're waiting for those questions to roll in, um, Diana, I had a question for you. This may show my ignorance because this is definitely not my area of expertise. So you talked about the response to the mixed meal um, as, as the outcome that you use in these examples. Are there other types of precision nutrition outcomes that are being modeled or is everything kind of focused on that right now? I think everything is so far on, and these machine learning studies and the modeling, the outcome has been shown that what okay. my team and um i looked at is you know we were like, we asked is the curve that you're after why are you just using the area under the curve we got a whole class on that it's called calculus <laughs> <laughs> points, timings maximums minimums critical points so we built a, a program it's called the canoculator and we named all our programs and that one um takes one of these curves and spits out for you the number of critical points, the absolute max, the timing of the absolute max, mins, all the stuff that you used to do in calc class. Um, so it's pretty nifty. And what we're seeing is that it, in some cases, it's showing um, that uh, it's timing of the inflection point that's important. So you don't get a signal from area under the curve. You get a signal from something else. And so, yeah. Um, but other than that, I've, I've only seen response curves being used. So if they're using them, but they're using them from different mixed meals, you know, you mentioned um, Boost versus a Snickers bar versus a muffin. How does that how, do, how does that work for transferring that understanding across these different systems? Or is it okay as long as all the modeling is done with one type of mixed meal? I think that's a great question. So this area is so new. Um, some of these questions were we were trying to come as a consortium to understand it. Like, if I give everybody a 500 calorie load of boost, does it matter that one person's bigger than the other? Will that affect it? Yeah. Um, so the answer was we don't really know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what's the difference? And gastric emptying should make a difference. Like it should go through a lot faster if it's liquid than if it if you are eating a muffin. Mm -hmm. I think that some of these questions will be answered for the first time by NPH. Okay. Because we're doing these things with all the same people. Okay. And are they controlling for things like medications the individuals are on? So Is it's that... not a statistical study. So you're not controlling. It'll yeah. be a factor. But are you you're collecting the, the data though? Okay. Okay. And you should always, because it could be a confounder if you're doing statistical studies. Right. I mean, I was thinking of these new anti-obesity medications affect gastric emptying, the GLP-1 agonists, for example. Right, right, right. Okay, very good. All right, we do have a question in the chat box. Um, how does a novice go about learning machine learning for precision nutrition? And I happen to know who's asking this question. She's she's not a novice by any means, but maybe a novice with regards to machine learning. She's she's one of my big statistical experts that I like to collaborate as well at UT Health. So um, everybody learns differently. Like they have their favorite ways to do it. I know some folks like to read papers, and um, I'm a big fan of videos, especially because of the programming aspect. So. I learned a lot just watching videos online. And um, I also learned because of need. So if you're in a, you know, in a project and you want to learn something new, you want to do something new, um, you know, how do I do that? I learned Python just because.
because of this study because I had a need. Okay. And um, so the, the need, like signing up for a study that you're going to have to learn it. And if it's not your main field, um, my favorite way is just asking. Like I started with Leanne Redmond, explain this to me. What are you doing here? <laughs> You're feeding someone this boost thing. And then what are you doing? Um, so, and then, you know, she'll, she'll curate the papers that will be best for you to learn. Like if you want to learn something new. So I learned the biology side by talking to Barbara Gower and Leanne Redmond. Okay. Um, so that's my favorite way is just to ask someone. Um, okay. It depends what your personality is like. Okay. That's great advice. But I would also suggest give yourself time for Can you all hear me still or I don't know if I froze or if Diana froze. Okay. We're just waiting to see if Dr. Thomas can get back connected. Again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll, we will keep feeding them to Dr. Thomas as she's, once she gets back on. <laughs> All right, so uh, while we wait for Dr. Thomas to get back on, uh, Di, tell me if you're there. I don't see your camera, but I see your name. But she was saying that um, she wanted to let people know that you want to give yourself focused time for learning if you're a novice. Um, I'm going to text her the next question so we can get it answered. Okay. All right, she's restarting her computer. Not sure what happened, but even those most tech savvy people like like Di have trouble with technology once in a while. We'll get her back on here momentarily. If you have other questions, feel good or feel free to enter them into the chat box. I'll just remind everybody in case you joined late that this webinar is sponsored by the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. And um, we're grateful for their expertise in um, doing, doing webinars for us. We've done many great webinars. Um, it's co-sponsored through the Digital Physical Activity and Diet Collaborative, or DPAD. And it's our goal at DPAD to bring together researchers who are interested in addressing um, obesity, diet, and physical activity through technology-based research. So you can see why Dr. Thomas's um, why Dr. Thomas's uh, topic was of such interest for this group. So I did ask um, Dr. Thomas by text message about using machine learning for qualitative data. And I suspected I knew the answer and I'm glad to see I was correct. She says, yes, you can use machine learning for qualitative data using the free form text analysis. And she's just in the process of getting logged back in, so she might be able to provide some additional information there. This is a methodology using the freeform text analysis is a methodology that I've just barely started to scratch the surface on. 
uh, but it's a really cool way to let people answer a question, uh, an open-ended question in a survey, and then use the use a computer approach to analyze those responses. So it's a much faster way to um, to get at qualitative data that's in a written form. So let's see, Di, are you still there? Or did you get back connected? I see your name. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you now. I was just... I don't know what happened. That's quite all right. I was just telling them about the free form text. If you want to go ahead and... Um, let's see, I think... Maybe, Becca, can you Becca. mute my second microphone? It looks like she's still connected twice, so there's an echo. There we go. Okay. So do you want to talk about the qualitative analysis with machine learning, Di? I tried to sure. sort of like bridge the gap there, but obviously I'm not an expert like you are. Free text response is something like microbiome data. It's like a rich source of new data that we actually have been slow to adopt. Um, the idea being that if we just ask people if they strongly agree or disagree or just neutral, that that data is easier to analyze and it will tell us about participants. But when you write, you leave behind yourself. You can't help it. Think about one of the things we know that is when people use a lot of I pronouns, I, me, they think of themselves as subordinate. Um, there's a focus on self. Now you're going to think about this as you leave. Um, look at your emails and how your emails are not the same to each person. If you think of yourself as being superior, you're going to we and you. I like to always say, when I say to my son, we are going to take out the garbage, it doesn't mean I'm going to hold his hand and take out the garbage. I expect him to take out the garbage. So we is a command structure. And it says a lot about where you think you are in the pecking order of this social interaction. So um, you learn a lot from free text. You can do groupings. Um, they, I think they have a name for it for qualitative analysis, but um, topic, topic modeling is done very much like clustering. It's an unsupervised method. So it's objective. So you're not the one that's deciding this group is this way. Um, and so it's, it's an it's a untapped area. We're definitely trying to do it in IWCR. We're just, we've just started looking at that data. That's amazing data. Um, and we are definitely trying to do that in all kinds of other venues, but it's new. It's not really been done. And so, and it takes time. And the, the IWCR is the International Weight Control Registry. We had a webinar on that last week where Dr. Jim Hill described that uh, international registry that's been launched. And Diana and I are both part of that collaborative as well. So that webinar is archived on the website if you're interested in accessing it, if you weren't, if you weren't joining us last week. So big, big survey type data where you can do open-ended responses and not have to pour through it with traditional qualitative methods is, is super powerful. All right, do we have any other questions? We're right at the end of our time. Is there anything you wish you would have said or been asked, Di, that, that we didn't ask you? Um, I know that this is long, a long time to watch something, um, so I appreciate the time. But if you do have questions that you think of, my email is diana.thomas at westpoint.edu. Just email me your question, and I'm happy to answer. Super. Thank you so much. And that's good for those that watch the recording after the fact, too. We have quite a high hit record with uh, recorded webinars, too. So thank you, everyone, awesome. for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Thomas. You can find this webinar at, uh, sorry, I lost the URL. I said it at the beginning of the webinar, so you can find it there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Di. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.